So let's start talking about adaptations organisms make to their physical environment. So the three main things we're going to be concerned with in the environment that affect the adaptations of organisms are water, temperature, and light. The three main things we're going to be concerned with are water, temperature, and light, and in this little lecture we'll look at water and nutrients as they affect the adaptations of organisms. Water is the universal solvent, and in it, nutrients and minerals are dissolved to move into organisms and in so into cells and tissues. So the chemistry of water is essential for life. <clears throat> There's a back and forth between carbon and oxygen in the processes of photosynthesis and respiration, where carbon dioxide or oxidized carbon from the atmosphere is reduced in carbon fixation, that's what we can also call photosynthesis, to form sugars in which energy is stored, the sun's or energy or perhaps energy from another source, and then that energy can be released when the sugars are oxidized in respiration. So photosynthesis and respiration are partner processes. Photosynthesis reduces carbon. Six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules combine with energy from the sun to form sugars and oxygen. So Oxygen is evolved from photosynthesis for the use of plants as well as other organisms to, under, to use respira in respiration. And th in that process, the sugar molecules combine with oxygen to release energy, to release also carbon dioxide and water. So in photosynthesis, water is a reducing agent donating electrons and in respiration the oxidizing agent is good old oxygen accepting electrons. So the nutrients that are dissolved in water can be categorized into two categories the major nutrients and the minor nutrients. In typical chemical fertilizer we use on plants or crops the components are N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And the other elements important are here abbreviated by their chemical abbreviation. So these nutrients are dissolved in water that the plants take up and then moved around inside their cells and also in animals that eat plants. So from general bio, you'll remember about osmosis, but this is important in water balance in organisms. The tendency of a solution to attract water is its osmotic potential, and that potential is greater if there's more <clears throat> sugars or salts or whatever dissolved in that water. So here in this little diagram, pure water on the right a solution with solutes, the purple dots on the left, the concentration of them is much greater on the left, so water will try to equilibrate and move from right to left. And semi-permeable membranes are really important in all kinds of organisms for regulating water. Only the small water molecules can move through them, not the larger solute molecules. And so if molecules need to move, they can also be moved by active transport in pumps, with pumps, and in certain organs of animal bodies, gills and kidney tubules and even skin, these pumps can be important. So in the middle of the ocean on a raft, maybe you saw The Life of Pi or read that book, I thought it was really good. Anyway, you could be surrounded by water, but none of it 
good or healthy for you to drink. Here in South Florida, we are surrounded by the ocean, but the water we drink comes from an underground freshwater aquifer. And it's important that we have fresh water to drink because most animals will shrivel and die. They won't do well on a diet of only salt water. We can describe cells or tissues or organs as um, how they relate to their environment osmotically. They're isoosmotic if the concentration of solutes is the same inside and out or the osmotic potential is the same inside and out. Hypoosmotic if the cell loses water to the environment and that would happen if it's in a less salty cell in a saltier environment. Or it could be hyperosmotic, where water will enter the cell, and that may happen if the cell is saltier than the surrounding fresh water. So here's a question for you. Let's say we're going to have a party in a couple days, and you want to get ready in advance because you have spare time now. You want to cut up some vegetables to dip in hummus or whatever, and you want to keep them fresh. Would it be better to put them in salted water? or keep them in plain water. And maybe you need to keep in mind too that a plant cell to remain turgid has to have water in the vacuole inside the cell. And the cell walls of a plant are rigid so that if they plant cells lose water, the plant will wilt and become less crisp consequently. So a plant growing in the soil has to get water into its internal plumbing, the xylem, which is made up of cells dead at maturity. And the water molecules in the xylem, these skinny tubes, is, are pulled up in long change, but chains by tension cohesion. And evaporation from the leaf surface of molecules pulls water up as these molecules evaporate. How does the water actually get into the roots? The plant roots are for not just holding the plant up, but to pick up water. And it's because of that that we often see root hairs on plants to greatly increase their surface area and be in direct contact with the soil and the water droplets that adhere to the soil particles. Um, one interesting observation that you can make easily in our greenhouse and outside in the weedy areas is that plants <clears throat> that grow as weeds in dry areas have very much bigger root systems than those that grow in well-watered situations. Which of these plants do you think is from a more well-watered situation? In general, those plants are top-heavy Plants that have to struggle for a living have more biomass under the ground. So water movement in plants can be understood if you look at the water potential. And we can talk about water potential of any part of the soil-plant-atmosphere continuum. Soil water potential is usually dominated by matrix forces, the forces holding the water to the soil particles. And typical benchmark values for this are field capacity, close to zero, negative 0.1. More negative, the soil's holding on to the water much more tightly because there's less of it. Negative 15 atmospheres, plants will start wilting at this point. And then up down to 100, negative 100 atmospheres on exceedingly dry soil. So most organisms have negative water potential to bring water into their cells or into their bodies because water moves from less negative to more negative water potential. And we can express water potential using the symbol psi, that looks like this little pitchfork. And the water potential of a plant is equal to solute potential, matrix potential, and press pressure potential. That's the part that comes from evaporation. 
So again, water molecules move in the direction of the more negative potential, and this will pull water across most biological membranes. So to answer that question, how does water move from the soil into the roots, the root hairs have more negative water potential than the soil. And that is a result of the fact that root cells usually have more solutes in them than the soil does. So as long as the water potential of the plant is more negative than that of the soil, psi of plant less than psi of the soil, water will move from the soil into the plant. Water molecules, remember, are end to end in long chains going up the vessels of the plant. We can look at this little root tip magnified in this box. The blue arrow is the water going in through a root hair up the xylem into the vascular cylinder of the plant, all the way up to the organs of the plant, like the leaves, to smaller and smaller veins and cells, and finally evaporating through the open stomata. So sometimes plant lovers can give their plants too much love. They can add so much fertilizer that it can harm a plant. And I want you to think about, with what you now know about water relations, why might it be, might it be harmful for a plant to have too much soluble minerals, nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium applied to its container? What would happen to that plant? So plants of dry places usually have smaller, thicker leaves. They have fewer stomata to let water exit the plant, and those stomata may be in crypts, little indentations under the leaves. There also could be boundary layer modifications. The leaves could be hairy, or the leaves could be held at angles to minimize solar radiation. But I guess I'm getting carried away with plants. I know we're animals, and we can't neglect animals. Small unicellular organisms could get water by absorption, and other animals, fungi too, I guess. But we often drink or eat to get our liquid, and certain animals like caterpillars never drink. They just eat leaves with water in them, and desert rodents might eat seeds and get all their water from those seeds. It's interesting to contrast fish of fresh and marine water, because marine fish are hypoosmotic relative to their surroundings. Water leaves through their gills, and so they have to drink water continuously, whereas freshwater fish are hyperosmotic. They are um, picking up water all the time through their gills. On the left is the marine fish with its hypoosmotic body fluids, drinking water and excreting through urine and through osmotic loss. Solutes move in from the seawater and they actively excrete or secrete sodium and chloride and uh, magnesium and sulfates in their urine, whereas a freshwater fish Water is moving into the fish all the time. He, they excrete in urine water. And food brings in nutrients uh, in their mouth, but they also take up nutrients through their gills. Sharks and rays have a different solution. These are creatures of marine waters. They keep urea in their bloodstream, which raises the uh, osmotic potential of their blood to that of seawater. And on this figure, you can see the great amount of urea in the blood and the contribution to the osmotic potential to the blood of the shark. In organisms of the land, the concentration of urine is related to the amount of water in the diet and in the environment. And many animals compensate their lack of salts by licking ungulates like deer or cattle love a salt lick. Butterflies can be seen puddling in places bigger animals have urinated, picking up salts that way. <clears throat> in most animals, nitrogen waste are accumulated in urea, 
which is less toxic to the organism than ammonia. And in birds and reptiles, there's not a separation of urine and feces. Instead, they have their wastes in uric acid. So there's a challenge in a three-dimensional organism on how oxygen can get inside to the tissues because all cells need to respire almost all the time and low oxygen could limit metabolic activity. But small organisms can rely entirely on diffusion of oxygen in relatively small but larger Insects and arthropods, they have tracheae, openings to an internal air pipe system. And then bigger organisms use blood circulatory systems with proteins that carry oxygen. And it's important to remember that in water, carbon dioxide comes from bicarbonate ions that are dissolved in the water. And this CO2 is essential for the photosynthesis of aquatic plants, cyanobacteria, algae.